much of what he shares in the Christmas carol is this whole idea that somebody who one day thought hated people, missed life, went through life pursuing gain and financial gain and thinking they're in competition with other people, and one day, because they were touched, everything changed. They were redeemed. Everything changed. And here's the truth for you and for me at Christmas as we talk about the thrill of hope. God has the ability to redeem anyone and everyone. That's why the Bible says, for God so loved the world. It didn't say, so God so loved only the people that he loved. It said, so God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And eternal life starts now. Now, in this series, we're talking about this verse. Isaiah chapter 7 says this, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. Now, today we're going to talk about this idea of redemption. And redemption, for many people, is a word they don't really know. So let me give you the definition, and then I'm going to give you an illustration. Redemption is the action of regaining or gaining possession of something in exchange for payment or clearing a debt. And that's what Jesus did for us. But a lot of people forget that word redemption. So I'm going to teach it to you with one of my favorite tools. Your hair's looking good there now, John. All right. Don't hate me because I'm beautiful. Remember that? Anyway. So I have had a Sears credit card forever. And had been, you know, use it at the grocery store and then pay it off every month. I don't keep a tab on it, one of those kind of things. And they kept sending me little emails and it would say, you got points. And I would look at the points and it would say, you got like 30 points. And so I would look at the email and I'm like, well, I can't buy anything with 30 points. And I'd get on and see what 30 points did. And I'm like, well, I'm not paying, you know, for a thing of tools, or whatever. So anyway, <clears throat> I had a problem with my credit card and called, actually talked to a person who said to me, hey, why aren't you using your points? I said, well, because I don't have very many. And they said, no, no, no. You have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of points. I was like, what? And they're like, yeah, you just need to do this and get online and you look under this and then you can find them. I got online and it was like, hallelujah. And then I've been wanting a blower for the, because I've been plugging mine in and, you know, you do the, and guys do the same thing. If we plug something in, we always see how far it can go. And so we unplug it 400 times because we think I can go a little far, oh, you know. And so then you have to run back to the garage and plug it back in and all. So I, I saw that they had this blower on sale. And I was so excited. And I ordered it and it came in the mail. And I took all, some of those, some of those, just some of the points I had and redeemed this blower from a storage facility in a box somewhere, the, the poor blower. And I now, I love him and care about him and take care of him, right? Now, here's the truth for us. It's such a bigger deal. The Bible talks about redemption in the fact that you are an, and I, like Rodney talked about, are in bondage to sin. We are in bondage to guilt and shame. We are in bondage to all this stuff. But Jesus came to redeem us to go to the factory and get us out of that box that we were in, to get us out of that darkness, that sin. And Christmas is about the hope that comes because you and I understand it's not because of something we did that we're redeemed. And when you find out you're redeemed, what it does, it changes just like Ebenezer Scrooge. He was selfish and self-centered. He thought life was about competition with other people. Just like that, redemption, when we realize that we have been redeemed, it changes us. It makes us more giving. It makes us more caring. It helps us to realize and be grateful for what we have. For some of us that are discouraged, when we realize, really begin to get a hold of what this idea of redemption means, we're encouraged. Because the truth is, when we do that, we begin to realize we did not get what we deserve. We were given so much more. And as we go through this life where we have these things, we, we realize that we need humility. We'll gain freedom through redemption. And then we'll also today talk about how we'll gain truth through redemption. So here's three truths about redemption that we're going to talk about today. Number one, 
God lifts the humble. And what that means is we don't deserve it. And we've got to come to the point that we realize we don't deserve God's love, but he gives it anyway. And so I want to look at three different people in the Christmas story. And these are probably three things you've not heard read a whole lot in church. Maybe the first one you've heard read, but probably the other two you've not heard in church. And so I want to give three different people that gave three different exclamations during the Christ birth story. And this is Mary. Mary had visited with Elizabeth. Elizabeth talked about how excited she was. Remember last week we talked about the baby jumped in the womb. And Mary says, this is called the Magnificat, by the way, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in, listen to these three words, God, my Savior. So Mary did not call herself a Savior. She didn't call herself the righteous one. She said she needed a Savior. And so she says, and God, my Savior, why? For he has been mindful to the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. This is the word blessed. It's not the word holy. It's not the word righteous. They're going to call her blessed, which means that she was given something. And remember earlier, she talked about the grace she had been given, unmerited favor. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. Now, she starts to just quote all kind of Old Testament scriptures. He has performed mighty deeds with his arms. He scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He's brought down the rulers from their thrones, but's lifted up the humble. He's filled the hungry with good things. And I love that at Christmas time. One of the things you really ought to try to do at Christmas time is to look for the needy and the hungry, whether it's physically, spiritually, emotionally, and go out of your way to feed them this time of year. And then it continues. But he sent the rich away empty. He's helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. Now think about Mary. Mary realized that it was not because of something she had done that God chose to bless her. Now here's the other thing. Because Mary realized what a gift it was that God, what God was doing was miraculous, she did not focus on the other things she could have focused on. One of the problems, I read a business book recently that talked about one of the problems today with some of the young people who are starting at work is because they've been told, these kids have been told all their lives, you're special, you're unique, everything you say is important. Then they start a job where people have been working there 20 or 30 years and they try to tell their manager how they should be running the business. How many of you have ever dealt with that at your job or workplace? Anybody dealt with that? Anybody had a teenager? That's pretty much a teenager. And by the way, that was true when I was a teenager too. That's just a whole different thing. But anyway, Humility is about not being focused on what you think you are owed. Humility is not about focusing on what you think you deserve, but recognizing that you really don't deserve anything, but God has chosen to bless you. We are so easily aggravated because if we're honest, we're prideful. Let, let me give you one simple illustration of this for me, okay? This is dumb, and I want you to know it's dumb. By the way, a sermon only works if it works in Uganda and works here. If you hear a sermon that you could not preach to a really poor person or somebody who doesn't have internet, then they're not really preaching the Bible if they're talking about prosperity being getting a first-class seat on an airplane or a parking spot, which, by the way, I've heard. Anyway, so I'm driving I have this really bad habit, and I'm really working on it, and that is this. When I see a light that's green, I get hopeful. Oh, the light's green, the light's green. If the light turns red and I have to stop for it, every single time I have a habit of doing this. I will even sit there, and I will have a diatribe in my head which goes like this. Every time they build a housing development, they put a new light in. I can't believe that they put a light every 12 feet in this town, and then they don't time them, and somebody needs to come out here and time it, right? You ever have a diatribe? It's a lot of fun. And you know what I'm doing? I'm not recognizing the blessing I've been given. Listen, I'm going faster than people ever went 100 years ago. Chuck Yeager, who broke the sound barrier, just passed away. They didn't even know they could break the sound barrier. We sometimes do that in our cars. Okay, not quite that fast, but... By the way, Bob has made up for all the tickets you did not get. I'm absolutely certain of that. Okay. 
It evens out. So here's the thing. What are you frustrated about this week? Was there a time where your internet went out and you went, oh, your TV didn't work right? Oh, the copy, evil copy machine at work didn't do things? Your washing dishwasher didn't get the clothes as clean as you. you know, what is the little minor thing that frustrated you this week? So I want you to close your eyes right here where you're at. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to thank God just a moment for something you've been blessed with today. Just close your eyes for just a minute and say, God, thank you for blessing me. God, thank you for a car. Thank you for a toothbrush. Take a moment just to thank him for what we have. That's humility. It's humbling ourselves before God. Number two, God gives freedom. And let me tell you what this is we're free from in America so often and other places too. We're not in competition with other people. I do not have to be like Rodney. He does not have to be like me. I don't have to be like Mike. Mike does not have to be like me. I don't have to be like David. David, thank God, does not have to be like me. Right? He wakes up every day. Thank God. It is not a competition. There was this guy named Harry Burnett Reese who lived in Pennsylvania. And he lived in Pennsylvania and he was looking for work. And so he went and got a job on this farm owned by this guy named Hershey. And so he got a job at this Hershey farm. I guess he was milking cows. I don't know exactly what he was doing. And then he wanted to go work at the Hershey Chocolate Factory. You've probably heard of that. How many of you have ever done that tour of the Hershey Chocolate Factory? I went to Hershey, didn't do the tour. I know, it's like the wrong thing. Anyway, so, um, so he starts working at the Hershey Chocolate Factory. On the weekends, he started developing his own, what he called, penny candy. And he developed, started developing his own penny candy, candy. It started to become popular. He started to make a lot of money. Hershey found out about it. Now, Hershey could have said, you no longer can have my chocolate to help you make your candy. Instead, Hershey made a deal with him to sell him his chocolate so that he could develop Reese's peanut butter cups. Oh, I'm thankful. <laughs> E.T. is thankful, right? This is how awesome it is. When Reese passed away suddenly in his 70s, Hershey the Hershey Company bought out Reese and gave them a percentage of the Hershey, Hershey, Hershey Company for each of the children to have a certain percentage to do what they want. Why? Because Hershey realized, I'm not in competition with him. And now if you look, Hershey Company is actually better off because they recognize that. Here's the truth for us. If we're not careful, we're trying to exalt ourselves instead of exalting Christ. Zachariah could not speak for months. He was doing pantomime. And then finally, his son John, who we call John the Baptist, is born. And this is what Zechariah says. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. There's that word redeemed. He got them out of the box. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us, the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies, from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham. There's Abraham again. To rescue us from the hand of our enemies and enable us to serve him, I love this, without fear and holiness and righteousness. Boy, I could go on with that one for a long time. And you, my child, it says next, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. So he's saying a blessing over his son. Hey, you're going to prepare the way. Because of the tender mercy of God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on the living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. So what did John's dad, Zechariah, realize? He realized that his son had a purpose. And his son's purpose was not to be the greatest. His son's purpose was to shine the light on the greatest. And so John the Baptist's focus was always on pointing people towards the Lamb, towards Christ, towards the one that would come. 
If John had felt like he was in competition with Jesus, which, by the way, Jesus' disciples and John's disciples, remember, John's disciples thought they were in competition. If John had thought that, he would have fought against the very principle God had for him. But here's the truth. He recognized that he was called to do what God wanted him to do and exalt Christ. Now, here's what I want you to know. You are not in competition with other people. And you will never have freedom in your life as long as you're constantly comparing yourself to other people, as long as you're always looking at other people, as long as you get frustrated when other people get something that you think you deserve, you will not have freedom. When you think it's not enough for you and you deserve more and you deserve better and you go and and smell the new car and you think, well, I should have that, you will never have freedom. You'll have bondage until you recognize God. I want to do what you've called me to do, and I want to point people towards you. When you do that, you find freedom. Zechariah knew that freedom. John the Baptist knew that freedom. And as Zechariah talked about his son, here's what he said. He said, son, you're going to be number two. Now, I don't know. Normally, we don't give that speech to our kids. But the truth is, for all of us, we should always say, I want to be number two. Because I want Jesus to be number one. So God lifts up the humble. Why? We don't deserve it. God gives freedom because it's not a competition. Number three, God reveals truth. What does that mean? We're all invited. Now, this is one of the proclamations that was made after Jesus was born. So a lot of times people don't include this in the uh, birth story. But the truth is, Luke included it in the birth story. And by the way, this was before uh, uh, the wise men came. How do I know that? Because when Mary and Joseph went to the temple, they got doves. Normally, when you had a child, you would get a lamb, unless you were poor. And if you were poor, you got doves. So if the wise men had already been there, then Joseph and Mary would have had a little bit of gold set aside, right? Don't you think? To get the lamb. But they didn't, so they got some doves. And they were doing what they were called to do. And Zechariah and Anna had been waiting. Anna, you have to forgive me for not telling her story today. It's one of my favorites. But I only had time for one. So here we go. Zechariah says this. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem, excuse me, called Simeon. I said Zechariah. I meant Simeon. Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. And then it says, moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. Time out. Listen. I want you to know something. That I believe when you spend time in God's Word, God can speak to you through His Word. But I also feel like God can give you impressions, especially as you spend time in prayer and in His Word. He can give you impressions to go out of your way for somebody. To be a blessing to somebody. To call a person, to check on somebody, to to do something God's called you to do. Why do I think that? Because of this right here. The Holy Spirit led him to go to the temple. If the Holy Spirit can lead this guy to go to the temple, he can lead you to reach out to somebody who needs encouragement, a blessing, a touch, a word. When the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you've promised, you can now dismiss your servant in peace. I love this. You know what he says there? I've seen Jesus. Now I can die. That's awesome. Okay, God, I did what you wanted to do. Please release me. Let me go. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations. Now listen to this. This is huge if you're not Jewish. A light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. What was he focused on? He was focused on the truth that God came to bless everyone. And for you and for me, if you want to live in the freedom of redemption, you have to understand the humility that comes with it. You have to understand the freedom of not comparing yourself. But you have to also understand that everyone is invited to that freedom and blessing and redemption that you have in Christ. Listen, I did not deserve this. I, got, I would have never found out about it, but I was able to trade in and get it. Listen, 
Jesus gave everything and traded in everything for you. And the Bible says it's a free gift from God, but you have to choose it. He has redeemed you. You have to take that gift of salvation, of redemption. When you and I realize as believers we've been redeemed, it should change how we look at life, no matter how bad life is. Some of you are having a hard time. Some of you watching online today are having a hard time. It's a struggle. There's trials. There's difficulties. There's things that aren't right. But when you recognize redemption, it's so much bigger than the struggles and the pain of this world that when you recognize redemption, the pain of this world grows dim. And if you're here today or you're watching online and you want to give your life to Christ, you can do that today. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, that means He loved you, that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish. That means they won't die, but they'll have eternal life. So if you want to do that today, I'd love to talk to you about what it means. Maybe you're watching online, you can do that. We're going to have a song now. Normally, this is our time of offering. Uh, If you're here, you can give on your way out. We're not passing a basket right now for obvious reasons. But you can give on your way out or you can give online. We have a bunch of ways to give online. We're glad for you to do that. You can also give on Facebook now. We've made it very easy for you. But the big deal is this. I want to encourage you this week to recognize the blessing of redemption you've been given. And as you focus on that, that it would change how you live, how you walk. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for your word and your power. I thank you for redemption. I thank you for the thrill of hope that we have in you. Lord, I pray that we would be more concerned about eternity than the now and now. That, Father, we'd be more concerned about our neighbor's eternity than their health today. That we'd be more concerned about those around us, those we love, their eternity. And we would understand that redemption you've given us and not live with our eyes on this world but live with our eyes on the fact that you have given us redemption. We celebrate that. As your birth, you came to us because we could not get to you. Lord, for those who are hurting today, I pray that your redemption, your peace, your power would flow on them, that they would know the presence of your love for them, and that you would give all comfort to each of them. Lord, thank you for these moments. In Jesus' name, amen.